Good evening and welcome everyone to this very first webinar in our series on the proposed K-12 education reform in Manitoba. Tonight we consider the questions, what does it mean and why does it matter? Our panel of esteemed guest speakers will explore these questions in relationship to three related topics. Dr. John Young will address school system organization. Dr. Jackie Kirk will explore leadership in education and Dr. Thomas Falkenberg will explore those questions in relationship to the purpose of education. My name is Michelle Honeyford. I'm the Acting Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and Research in the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba. It's my honor to facilitate the webinar this evening, supported in the background and behind the scenes by Tamara Gillum, Confidential Assistant to the Dean. It's important as we begin this evening to consider where we are, to gratefully acknowledge the land that we are on and our respect for its original peoples and caretakers. The journeys that have brought us each individually to this event this evening may be very different, but collectively together this evening, in whatever ways we may care or be concerned about education, it is important to acknowledge the truth about Canada's residential school system, which included residential and day schools in Manitoba. More of that truth was revealed last week. We grieve for families, for the loss of the lives of children, brothers and sisters, friends and cousins. We grieve as well for what was lost in the lives of those who survived for the loss of culture, stories, teachings, and language, connection to the land, to families and communities, and ways of learning, knowing, and understanding. As we consider this evening questions about school organization, leadership, and purpose, we need to acknowledge that truth. Just as we also need to recognize, honor, and contribute to the well-being and flourishing of every child, family, and community as our collective responsibility in education. So as I read the land acknowledgement of the University of Manitoba, I invite you individually and all of us together to pause for just a moment to reflect on where we are tonight as we enter this conversation. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. It is now my delight to introduce this evening's guest speakers. Our first panelist is Dr. John Young. Dr. Young is a professor emeritus in the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba and former head of the Department of Educational Administration, Foundations and Psychology. He's written extensively on governance issues in Canadian public schooling, and particularly on the role and importance of school boards. Dr. Young's presentation will speak to restructuring public participation in public education in Manitoba. What does it mean and why does it matter? Our second panelist is Dr. Jackie Kirk. Dr. Kirk has been at Brandon University for 12 years. She currently teaches a graduate course in educational leadership, in addition to other classes in both the graduate and undergraduate levels. She has an active research agenda that includes the counseling role of the school principal, social justice leadership, and integrating technology into classroom practice. Prior to coming to Brandon University, she experienced the amalgamation of rural school divisions in Saskatchewan from the perspective of the role of consultant. After leaving her position to pursue her PhD, she completed a retrospective study of the provincial amalgamation that was commissioned by the Saskatchewan School Boards Association 
her doctoral research focused on the transitions of school division leaders through the changes that were initiated by that restructuring process. That work has impelled her to be keenly interested in the process that is currently underway in Manitoba. Dr. Kirk will speak on leadership and Manitoba's Education Modernization Act. Our third panelist is Dr. Thomas Falkenberg. Dr. Falkenberg is the Acting Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba and has been a professor in the Department of Curriculum, Teaching and Learning since 2005. He has been teaching courses in the areas of mathematics education, learning and developmental theory, sustainability and well-being education, and research methodology. The focus of his current research project is on well-being and well-becoming in and through education. Dr. Falkenberg's presentation will explore the question of the purpose of school education. Each of our speakers has prepared to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes and will move hopefully smoothly without much interruption from one to the other. While video and mics are muted in this webinar format for all of you attending, we hope you'll participate and interact with our speakers through submitting any questions you may have. You can submit your questions anytime by clicking on the Q&A icon on your screen. Please note that that's different from the chat function. I'll be monitoring the Q&A and we'll draw from the questions you pose there to ask our presenters after their formal remarks. At this time, we'll begin the presentations, starting with Dr. John Young. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, on March the 15th, the Manitoba's progressive conservative government released a package of education documents that together signaled the government's long anticipated agenda for restructuring public education. These documents were the final report of the Commission on K-12 Education, Better Education Starts Today, Putting, edu putting Students First, the government's response to the Commission's report and its education reform strategy, and Bill 64, the Education Modernization Act. In rapid order, Manitoba will move to a highly centralized public education system built upon a radically restructured pattern of governance and provincial local government relationships. In the next 15 minutes, I will briefly attempt to lay out the main changes proposed in Bill 64, discuss these changes in relation to two distinct models for provincial local governance, and to offer some comments on the proposed changes based upon a particular perspective on what makes public education public. <clears throat> Bill 64 will abolish all elected school boards in Manitoba with the exception of the Francophone school board that has constitutional protection. We'll create a provincial education authority with an appointed provincial education council will restructure the existing 37 school divisions into 16 regions. It will restructure public community participation at the local school level through the creation of school community councils. It will create a provincial advisory committee. It will take school principals and vice principals out of the Manitoba Teachers Society for the purposes of collective bargaining. It will see public school funding coming 100% from provincial revenues, which may or may not include provincial property tax. And it will implement provincial collective bargaining. In order to get a better picture of what's going on here, I think it's useful to look at a typology of central local governance models that George Bernard and Steve Lawton used to look at educational restructuring in Ontario in the second half of the 20th century. Their typology distinguishes between three ideal types of relationships, which they refer to as a centralized model of administrative agency, a policy tutelage model, and a decentralized model of policy interdependence. 
I will focus on administrative agency and policy interdependence tonight as I consider policy tutelage essentially a hybrid or middle ground between these two. Administrative agency is a model that they suggest envisions a systematic hierarchy of legislative and executive agencies over which the central provincial legislature is supreme. The proper role of local government and local agencies is a subordinate agency of the center where their task is to ensure accountability and efficiency through regulation enforcement and uniform service delivery. School boards where they exist in this model are expected to be faithful ex executors of centrally defined mandates, responsible for the top-down implementation of central policy. Maybe I could see the next slide now, please. Politicized administrative agency is a concept introduced by Badard and Lawton when discussing the specifics of education reform in Ontario under the Mike Harris progressive government, progressive conservative government between 1995 and 2002. They use the term politicized to signal three things. First, that major education policy decisions were being driven by a larger political goal of restructuring, downloading, and downsizing public services and a series of ambitious tax cuts. Second, that education policy was being driven by a small group of advisors in the Premier's office, along with a few close cabinet ministers. This is distinct from a traditional administrative agency model where power resided with the Minister of Education and top levels of the education bureaucracy. Third, they suggest that education ministers here, rather than being the policy makers, were simply the messengers of the policy. Policy interdependence, on the other hand, is a more decentralized model of governance where central and local authorities, along with other important stakeholders, such as teacher unions, school board associations, parent council associations and universities, share power collaboratively to make policy. In this model, they suggest diversity in the local adaptation of policy is welcome. Rather than being assessed on the basis of fidelity to centrally defined policy statements, key players in interdependent roles are encouraged to be reflective and collaborative partners. In this regime, policy evolves out of dialogue and bargaining. There is an expectation that policy adaptation will reflect local interests and context. And there is an acceptance of ambiguity in education policy. So the point I'm trying to make here is that while these models represent ideal types in the sense of extreme or pure constructions, and the reality is usually likely to be somewhere in between and more complex, that what is being laid out in Bill 64 represents a very substantial shift from a governance model of, for public schooling that has traditionally more closely resembled policy interdependence to one premised on the assumptions of administrative agency. So the next question is, so what? What's wrong with that? For me, criticisms of the government's planned restructuring can be grouped into three categories. One, the policy development process. Two, the substance of the policy and the legislation. And three, the planned implement implementation timeline for the proposal. It's not easy to find an answer to the question, where did this policy come from? The central in intent of Bill 64, the abolition of school boards and the creation of a provincial 
Education Authority is quite different from the recommendations of the K-12 Education Review Commission, which reported widespread support for school boards and recommended retaining them, albeit in an amalgamated and modified format. Indeed, in a Winnipeg Free Press article on March the 24th, Commissioner J.D. Lees stated that the Commission barely discussed the possibility of abolishing school boards. Further, in perhaps the most comprehensive submission made to the Commission, the Manitoba School Boards Association included, from, included data from an independent probe research survey that showed very strong public support for school boards. So who is making this policy? The Minister of Education changed just prior to the release of the report and the introduction of the legislation. The Department of Education is led by a very accomplished, accomplished civil servant, but someone whose prior experience was primarily with the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, not in education. So there's little to indicate to me that this policy is being driven either pro by professional expertise from educators and from research or by public demand. Okay, secondly, there are issues related to the substance of the policy that I want to talk to now. Along with public access and public funding, public participation in the shaping of the ways in which schools educate our children and youth has always been a central touchstone of public schooling in Canada, of what makes public schools public. It is an important aspect of public confidence in and public support for our schools. It's my argument that the whole notion of better education loses its legitimacy without the opportunities for ongoing public conversations about purposes and procedures for our schools. And Bill 64 weakens public participation and essentially redefines who will constitute the public. The elimination of school boards and the creation of large administrative regions weakens public participation. And the focus on parent-based school community councils offers a very narrow vision of the public. The repro proposed replacement of 36 school boards and some 300 locally elected school trustees with a provincial education authority with six to 11 members appointed by cabinet, I believe represents a major weakening of public participation in public schooling. Those 300 trustees not only represented a substantial public presence and involvement in local education decision making, but they are the vehicle for a much larger involvement by dealing with individual concerns and through community presentations on such key issues as annual budget setting, how resources are to be allocated for the year, and school programming. Shifting the authority for these decisions to a regional director of education appointed by a provincial educational authority both centralizes and bureaucratizes our school system. Elected school boards currently have a dual responsibility to implement provincial policy for sure, but also to represent local community interests. This is different from appointed regional directors of education whose ta task will be to implement provincial policy and to manage local concerns. <clears throat> the expectation that they will consult is to me a far weaker concession to public participation. <clears throat> to criticize elected school board members for their lack of appropriate skills and expertise is disingenuous and mi misrepresents their role. They're elected to represent the public with all its, of its imperfections just as the provincial legislature is elected. Expertise resides with the professional bureaucracy. And in a democracy, it is their task to inform the elected boards 
and convince them of the wisdom of their expertise. Replacing 37 school divisions with 16 regions has an, has an impact on participation too. Currently, school divisions vary considerably in terms of their student enrollment and geographical size. The proposed new large regions will create regions with some 2,500 students in the smallest region and around 100,000 in the largest, the city of Winnipeg. Each will be led by a director of education, appointed by a provincial education authority and subject to approval of the Minister of Education. While there is nothing sacrosanct about school division boundaries or clear evidence about what constitutes an optimum size for administrative efficiency, these new regions, particularly the designation of Winnipeg as a single region, again raise questions about how much attention will be afforded local concerns and local initiatives. And since representation on the Provincial Advisory Council is based upon these regional entities, the fact that the city's 100,000 students will have only one voice on this council, again, has been raised as a concern. No wonder Negan Sinclair in his Winnipeg Free Press column from, of, on March the 18th, commentated, commented that, on, that the centralization of education authority and the stifling of local voices would set back indigenous education decades. It was his, his conclusion that Bill 64 is a dramatic undoing of nearly four decades of work in indigenous education. that was just beginning to produce improved graduation rates and cultural competency. It is not, he says, is not modern, but a very old, well-traveled path in Canada. In terms of what constitutes the public, I can't go into a detailed discussion of the complexities of who constitutes the public, but an examination of the ways in which Bill 64 restructures school community councils and the proposed Provincial Advisory Council indicates a very narrow interpretation of the public and of public consultation, limited to parents, meaning parents of students currently attending a specific school. These are constituted as both the public and the community, albeit uh, the government notes parents can also refer to other caregivers. As such, school community councils are different from the advisory councils on school leadership created under the progressive conservative government of Gary Filman in the 1990s, which allowed for community members without children currently attending the school, a student in high school and, a and teacher representation in their membership. While both are advisory in nature, the latter model appears to me to be much more about having a dialogue about school life than the oversight design reflected in school community councils. Even if the reform is successful in creating some 700 active school communities across the province, they will constitute a shift towards the notion of parents as consumers and the commodification and privatization of a public good. Finally, a third set of critiques of the reforms contained in Bill 64 relate to the planned implementation timeline. The government has set July 22 as their target date for the implementation of these structural reforms. To me, there are two problems here. First, going ahead with these changes after two massively disruptive school years due to the COVID pandemic makes no sense. As Brian O'Leary argued in the April 19th edition of the Free Press, what is needed now is a period of calm and stability, a period of recovery, a chance for us all to catch our breath. 
further a corollary to this, I think one can argue that if, as the commission and the government both argue, there is a need to take action across a broad range of teaching and learning issues to improve student learning outcomes, then starting the process with large scale structural changes is to me strategically questionable. What we do know from previous amalgamation initiatives is that major governance reforms are hugely disruptive for considerable periods of time. Draining the system, already exhausted by COVID, of energy and resources that could be focused on teaching and learning recommendations that have a much more direct connection to student outcomes. So in conclusion, Bill 64, we are told, is a bold, bold step to create better education and in short order to make Manitoba's school system the most improved in Canada. Who can argue with those as goals? Not me. But Bill 64 lays out an administrative agency model of governments and argues that school community councils and the provincial advisory council provide an appropriate structure for public participation in providing for our children's education. I remain to be convinced. School boards are too important to lose and the vision of creating better education by weakening public participation in it makes little or no sense to me. And it does matter. Thank you. Thanks for coming to join us tonight. I'm Jackie Kirk from Brandon University, where I'm a member of the Department of Leadership and Educational Administration. I'd like to acknowledge that Brandon University is located on Treaty 2 lands, the traditional homelands of the Dakota, the Anishinaabe, the Ojikree, the Cree, the Dene, and the Métis people. I want to begin by setting the context for my thoughts on leadership as it relates to the proposed changes laid out in Bill 64 or the Education Modernization Act. Before I get too deeply into the topic, I wanna to discuss my personal beliefs and assumptions. I've been working in education since 1986 and over that time, I've convinced myself that a few things are true, at least in my opinion. I understand that you might disagree with me and I welcome you to explore other options, but to appreciate my perspectives tonight, I think it's important for you to know where I stand. So first, I believe in teachers. Teachers have knowledge and skills that equip them to understand the learning needs of their students in their classrooms and to respond with appropriate interventions. They care deeply about the success of their colleagues, their students, and their school communities, including parents. I trust them to work hard and to invest into the system so that education goes forward effectively. Second, I believe that educational leaders in Manitoba, including in school administrators and those working throughout the school system, are well-educated and equipped with knowledge and skills to lead education. They're committed to working together with teachers and parents to create a strong and effective education system. I trust our educational leaders. Third, after working in many diverse communities, I've learned that parents, all parents, care deeply about the success of their children and families. In my experience, parents have always cared deeply about developing effective relationships with schools and teachers, despite the fact that those relationships are sometimes characterized by tension that threatens classroom effectiveness. Teachers, leaders, and families are the basic building blocks of education, and I have a firm belief that academic achievement, as well as social emotional growth, are successful when those three foundational groups work together. <clears throat> 
Therefore, I also believe that government plays a more restricted role. However, either limiting or it can be encouraging to the work that takes place within schools. I think that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about that piece and about whether or not um, Bill 64 is going to limit our effectiveness as an education system or whether it's going to promote effectiveness. When I think about change, I always think about William Bridges. In this diagram, he explains how change takes place over time. At the beginning, where it says we are here, he says we are consumed by the ending. And we're always worried about the losses that are upcoming and what we will experience when the new policies come into effect. And I don't know about you, but for me, when I've been reading about and thinking about what Bill 64 will mean for Manitoba, I'm making lists of all the things that I think we need to pay attention to as the restructuring process evolves. As we move from left to right, Bridges says that we'll go through a period of uncertainty that he calls the neutral zone. And in that period of time, we'll feel really uncomfortable. But he also sort of confirms for us that teachers and administrators and families will be working hard to figure out how to do their work within the new context. He says that the neutral zone is a really difficult place for the people involved in the change, but it, that it often leads to unique solutions and improvements over what we knew in the past. Um, he suggests that humans seem to be sort of hardwired to take what they know, add new information, and make something that's actually better than before. In this case, it might be possible for the new system to be better, but I personally think that depends on whether the structure of the system is overly limiting to the success of education. Finally, in the last phase, Bridges says that we emerge into a new reality and we start to feel more comfortable with the changes that have been imposed because we've developed new systems. And that because of our past knowledge, um, those new systems are potentially even better than how we did things in the past. And so we feel more comfortable, maybe even more comfortable than we did before for some people who felt like change was necessary. Before I begin, I want to just sort of review some of the things that John was talking about and to look at where I see the structure for leadership within the proposed bill. Um, I can see clearly that there are four groups that have been outlined um, for educational leaders in the province. The first one, that I see is for in-school leaders. Um, principals and vice principals have been recognized. Uh, we see that they're going to increase their leadership responsibilities. They're going to have an increased responsibility for the accountability of the work of the in-school team. And they're going to be taken out of scope and out of the teacher's bargaining unit. The next, um, group is the school community councils. There will be a school community council for each school. Uh, they'll have some leadership responsibilities and the documentation clearly says that this group will have funding to support its work. Um, the next one is the Provincial Advisory Council on Education or PACE and one person will be elected from each of the school from each region from within the school community councils in that region. And finally, they have the provincial education authority and members of this body will be appointed by the government 
to represent each of the 15 regions. At least two of them will be people who are currently serving on PACE and one member will be representing the Francophone School Division. So that's sort of the context that we see for leadership going forward. In the next part of my address, I wanna talk about the possible tensions. So what do we need to watch out for? What are the issues that might arise given the information that we know at this time? I mentioned to you earlier that I was making a list of things that I thought we needed to pay attention to as we move forward. Here are a few that I'd like to share with you. First, what should we think about when administr administrators move out of scope? Bill 64 removes principals and pr vice principals from the teacher bargaining units. What will that look like? Well, the documents clearly um, say that uh, administrators would be able to return to the classroom, that they could remain in the teacher union, and that they would have their seniority and pension and benefits protected. It says that those leaders would have in enhanced instructional leadership responsibilities and that they would create a new framework that would support in-school leaders. On the items on this slide, I have a few worries on my list about moving um, in-school administrators out of scope. Um, in the document that was circulated, the government suggested that removing teachers or removing administrators from the teachers bargaining units removes a conflict of interest where administrators were tasked with um, doing leadership for people that were within the same bargaining unit and um, holding some accountability responsibility for the work of those people. Uh, but Bill 64 positions in school administrators as accountability agents, as well as instructional leaders. And I honestly think that to be a strong instructional leader, you need to gain the trust of teachers and teachers need to know that it's okay to make mistakes. Growth and learning is always dependent upon vulnerability. And so to grow in our practice, um, you have to be able to be vulnerable. Uh, so if you're the leader that's charged with holding teachers accountable for their actions and the one that's tasked with leading their instruction and helping them to grow, I think it still feels like a conflict of interest. And although the conflict of interest has shifted somewhat, I think in education, that's one of the things that goes along with leadership. And I don't know if there's a way to eliminate that. On the other hand, I believe that teachers and principals, um, like they have in the past, will work hard to successfully overcome those perceived or sometimes real obstacles and find ways to work together effectively. I wanna talk for a minute before I move on about the new leadership framework. I have a lot of questions about the new leadership framework. Um, for example, who will be asked for input? How will it help us to understand leadership in this altered environment? I've served on a provincial committee that has developed a framework that guides the school leaders certificate. That framework evolved from collaborative efforts by representatives of many of the major stakeholders in education in Manitoba. That framework structures the important com components of educational leadership. It's based in research and it's supported by the documents that are foundational to education in our province. I wonder if the new framework will include that framework or if it would be informed by that framework in any capacity. I hope to see that the work of that committee is not overlooked when these sweeping changes take place. 
who's priv whose voices are privileged by Bill 64? When we view policy through a critical lens, we have to ask, does the particular policy privilege some voices while silencing others? This seems to be an item on the list of many people in Manitoba because I see it in the media on a regular basis. When we ask that question about Bill 64, two things become clear. First, rural voices will be elevated from their current status. I'm not actually opposed to that. I grew up on a farm outside of a small isolated community in southwestern Saskatchewan. I have also taught in several very rural communities in rural Canada. So I know firsthand that rural voices are rarely represented adequately in provincial systems. On the other hand, I am distressed by the potential for marginalized voices to be silenced by Bill 64. As Brawl points out in her infographic, um, this infographic that you see on the screen uh, was published uh, in an article for the Canadian um, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. And I think it does an excellent job of sharing the numbers that explain um, how Bill 64 marginalizes diverse voices. 63% of Manitoba's Black, Indigenous and people of color live in Winnipeg. Bill 64 grants the entire city of Winnipeg one representative on the Provincial Education Authority. I'm not sure who that person will be, though I have some predictions, but I am sure that it will be impossible for them to represent the broad spectrum of perspectives and experiences within the city and within the education system. Just last week, I had the opportunity to listen to Ibram X. Kendi, the director of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. And in preparation for listening to his lecture, um, I, had, I took the time to read his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. One of the quotations from the book is, policy is either racist or anti-racist. There are no neutral policies. If that's the case, Bill 64 definitely isn't an anti-racist policy. What promotes system agility and the ability to respond to political issues? When I went over the materials about Bill 64, um, specifically uh, the document that's called Better Education Starts Today, Putting Students First. It's a little bit confusing. Um, when it says that having 37 school divisions prevented agility during COVID-19, does it really mean that gov the governance structure prevented the provincial government from responding with a one-size-fits-all response? Um, so it says that the number of small school divisions that uh, prevented agility during COVID-19, um, yet it also makes the claim that um, there will be greater local control and an opportunity to address local issues. But what I see in the bill is a move towards centralization of authority and I can't think of an example um, that a centralized system led to less led to less local control or to more local control. And that I think normally when we think about centralization, we think about reducing responsiveness and agility at the local level. A group of my colleagues and I have just completed a study that focused on digital policies and procedures and practices 
in rural Manitoban school divisions. Our research took place during COVID, but it wasn't necessarily focused on COVID. Um, but we did ask a question about how um, the technology committee or technology personnel in the school division was able to respond to the technological needs during COVID. Um, and we very much disagree with the statement that large numbers of small school divisions prevented an agile response to COVID-19. Well, at least when it comes to technology. So on the screen, you'll see a quotation from um, the one document that we've published out of our research so far. It says, in places where divisions have remained small, leaders are able to respond with agility. They can pivot quickly during a pandemic, for example, and institute new and innovative ways of delivering education, such as loaning laptops for students who needed them. They can receive feedback from the classroom level about which platforms are preferred by teachers, students, and families. They can provide support and guidance quickly when issues arise or training is needed. Rural places are unique and deserve education that meets those needs. What will happen to the highly trained and experienced professionals that are currently leading education in Manitoba. Perhaps it is just not defined yet. I can see how parents fit into the system and how um, their input and their ability to participate has been enhanced by the new system. I can see how teachers and in-school leaders fit. But I'm still concerned about how we will maintain access to the knowledge, experience, and training that's held by educational leaders that are working outside of the school building. There are a large number of people that are involved in education in Manitoba right now um, that support the system and that are really important to the success of the system. And I can't see in the documentation how their roles move forward. And finally, um, I wanna talk about what happens when you shift power structures. The, liter the literature that was distributed regarding Bill 64 suggests that parents would be given authority and funding through school community councils. Power is a difficult phenomenon to negotiate. Parents are promised leadership, some authority and funding to support their tasks. Principals are removed from the bargaining unit and given further responsibility for leadership and accountability. Power changes relationships and relationships are key to effective educational organizations. This was one of the clearest findings from my dissertation research. The leaders who were involved in my study talked passionately about how structural changes led to power shifts and they were firm in their belief that it was important to address the power relationship issues before moving forward with further changes. In school divisions where they failed to do this effectively, they were haunted by the power conflicts that evolved as a result. Where leaders addressed these issues openly and immediately, and it seemed, it seemed to clear the way for stronger relationships. I don't think we can deny that Bill 64 changes the power structures within school communities and within the province. It will be important for us to negotiate those relationships before we move forward with associated changes. This brings me to the end of my list that I want to share with you tonight. I just want to take a minute to say that when I prepared for tonight, I tried to stay focused on what we know to be the facts about Bill 64 as it has been shared. I believe at this point that it's hard to predict whether it will be a success or a failure. 
I think it's important that people across the province make their own lists and keep track of the new pieces of information as they become available to answer the questions that we still have. I also hold firm to my belief that the key to effective education lies within the work of students and teachers, in-school administrators, parents and caregivers. To ensure the success of our system as we move forward, and we want to ensure the success of our system. We need to support those individuals to continue to use their knowledge and skills to provide strong educational programs. Bill 64 doesn't seem to dismantle the work of those units, but it does seem to take down the remainder of the system that supports the work of in-school professionals. I'm still unclear about how SCCs, the PACE, and the Provincial Education Authority will take up the important work of creating an infrastructure to provide support to ensure that educational professionals can do their work. In my opinion, those are the questions that we need to be asking. Those are the things that I currently have on my list. Thanks for listening. I'd like to start off my presentation with a quotation about administration decision making. In the process of decision making, those alternatives are chosen, which are considered to be appropriate means for reaching desired ends. Ends themselves, however, are often merely instrumental to more final objectives. We are thus led to the conception of a series or hierarchy of ends. Rationality has to do with the construction of means-ends chains of this kind. This is a quotation from the classic book, Administrative Behavior, a study of decision-making processes in administrat administrative organizations by the Nobel Prize winning economist and cognitive psychologist, Herbert Simon. The idea of means and hierarchies that guide rational decision-making whether in organizations or our lives more generally, is not new and, for instance, can already be found articulated in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. In my presentation, I use the means and idea to address the purpose question of school education, which means that I will deal with the question, what is the purpose, aim, goal of school education? In the educational sciences, this question is generally dealt with in the field of philosophy of education. The distinction between means and ends and the articulation of a means and hierarchy is not just important for rational decision making. In the context of school education, the purpose question, or better to say, an answer to the purpose question, is of great social and political importance for at least the following two reasons. First, According to governmental budget documents in the fiscal year 2021-22, Manitoba education receives a budget of about $3 billion out of a total of $18 billion for expenditures. After health and seniors care, the education budget is the second large, second highest budget across all governmental departments. We better are clear on the purpose for which we are willing to spend that much public money. This is a justification reason for answering the purpose question. The purpose justifies the spending. Second, an answer to the purpose question gives us direction for where Manitoba wants to go when spending this money. As I've read somewhere early in my education, my own education to become a teacher, if you don't know where you're going, you should not be surprised if you arrive somewhere else. This is a direction giving reason for answering the purpose question. The purpose directs the school educational project. My presentation has two main parts. First, I will speak to the role that the purpose question plays in the designing, planning, and enacting of school education. Second, I will speak to the response to the purpose question that is provided in the current governmental K-12 education reform proposal discuss this response in light of what I will have said in the first part of my presentation. <laughs> 
the role of the purpose question for school education. Above, I said that purpose directs the school education project. What actually is it that an answer to the question, what is the purpose of K-12 education impacts, or better to say should impact? Well, it actually should direct all pillars of which school education, upon which school education rests. First, the purpose of school education should determine what we mean by being successful in school. Second, the purpose of school education should determine what we hold the school education system accountable to. Third, the purpose of school education should direct resource allocation within the school system. Fourth, the purpose of school education should frame the school curricula. And finally, fifth, the purpose of school education should frame the so-called hidden curriculum, which includes policies and practices in schools that are part of the social socialization experience of students without being directly articulated as educational goals as it is in the subject-based curricula. The crucial point for the dis discussion on the purpose of school education is that it is not just important to have an answer to the purpose question, but that it is as important that these five relationships I just mentioned are discussed as well. I will now illustrate why that is the case by drawing on a real life example of an articulated purpose of school education. On the Manitoba Education website, the following mission of and vision for public school education can be found. The mission is articulated there as to ensure that all Manitoba children and youth have access to an array of educational opportunities such that every learner experiences success through relevant, engaging and high quality education that prepares them for lifelong learning and citizenship in a democratic, socially just, in sustainable society. The vision for Manitoba school system is articulated as that every, every learner will complete a high school education with a profound sense of accomplishment, hope, and optimism. For the sake of the illustration, let's take the sections highlighted in red as an answer to the question what the purpose of public school education is. If we do so, then this purpose of school education has, or should have, the following impacts on educational policies and practices. First, as a purpose of public education, this answer should define what we mean for students to be successful in their school education. Students are successful in their school education if they graduate from high school and do so with a profound sense of accomplishment, hope, and optimism. And they graduate as lifelong learners and prepare to be part of and contribute to a society that is democratic, socially just, and sustainable. Second, this purpose of education should also determine what we have to hold the school system accountable for, namely that all students are successful in their school education in the above defined sense. That means, for instance, we have to hold the school system to account if we have a great number of students graduating from high school, but do so with a diminished sense of accomplishment with little hope for and optimism about their future. Third, this purpose of school education should also direct resource allocation to help all students to be successful in their school education in the above defined sense. For instance, funding formulas would need to give consideration to the different resource needs across school divisions to allow all students to achieve the success, school success as defined. Fourth, this purpose of school education should also frame what subjects are taught in school, how much time is allocated to each of the subjects, and what the curriculum for each of the subject, subjects looks, looks like. Considering the goal of preparing students for a democratic, socially just, and sustainable society, maybe this purpose of school education suggests to give up the idea of separate subjects and their curricula and replace them with a more holistic curriculum that integrates subject areas. Fifth, this purpose of school education should also frame the day-to-day -day experiences of students in school. For instance, if we want students to graduate as citizens of a democratic and socially just society, students not just have to learn what characterizes a democratic and socially just society, but they also have to experience and participate in a democratic and socially just school community. 
The mission of, mission of and vision for public school education currently posted on the government's website is in substance identical to the one the previous NDP government had posted at, at the time of their being in government. I think this points to an important quality that answers to the purpose question of public education should have. They should somewhat be shared across the large population, the larger population, sorry, and as such be supported across political parties, considering that the public school curricula are mandated for all Manitoba children, regardless of what form of school education their parents have opted into. Before I move on to the next section of my presentation, let me summarize in broad strokes what I have suggested up to now. There are social and political reasons why there should be an explicitly articulated answer to the purpose question for the Manitoba school system. Such an answer then determines how we should understand school success, determine the criteria against which we hold the education system to account, directs how we identify and justify the allocation of educational resources, frames school curricula and frames policies and practices in schools and classrooms. I now move to the second part of my presentation. The purpose question and the proposed K-12 education reform. Looking through the lens of the purpose question at Bill 64, the Better Education Starts Today, BEST report, and accompanying documents, I make the following observations. First, I could not find any reference in any of these documents to the currently posted mission of and vision for public education that I quoted above. If the mission and vision stay in place for public education, the K-12 education reform will need to be aligned to and justified relative to this mission and vision. And I provided a rationale for this in the first part of my presentation. If as part of the education reform, the mission and vision for public education are deleted, then for the same reasons, they need to be replaced by something else. What is currently outlined in the BST report is not sufficient as an answer to the purpose question, as I will argue in a moment. My second observation is that while I did not find any reference to the current mission and vision in the document, documents, I did find in section 14, of the proposed Education Act, which is part of Bill 64, the following. Provincial objectives and priorities, section 14, the minister must establish objectives and priorities for the education system in the province. This means that based on section 14, we can expect objectives and priorities for the school education system to be made public by the minister. Referring back to Herman Simon, we can say, that what section 14 should entail is the provision of a clearly articulated means and hierarchy with an answer to the purpose question at its top, so that that answer can serve as justification for decisions made in the five areas of educational policy and practice that I identified above. My third observation when reading through the documents is that there are a few references to elements of the current posted mission of and vision for school education in Manitoba. In the DEST report, for instance, there is talk about ensuring that all students are ready for lifelong success. There's also talk about measuring outcomes and the competencies needed for life. And there's talk about K-12 education provides the foundation for students' lives. While well, those could be understood as affirming some of the aspects of the current posted mission and vision, those references are currently not articulated as central to the purpose of school education. Furthermore, they are not used to define school success. They are not used to justify what the education system is held accountable for. They are not used to justify resource allocation. They are not used to justify curricular priorities, and they are not used to justify educational policies in schools and practices in schools and classrooms. This lead me to my four, leads me to my fourth observation. While there are a number of objectives and priorities for the school education system articulated in the BST report, these objectives and priorities cannot serve as answers to the purpose question for school education in Manitoba. They have more the status of means rather than ends. I want to illustrate this through two examples. 
The BST report outlines four pillars for student success. Pillar two is high quality learning and outcomes for which the document identifies as objectives and priorities for student learning, improving scores on national and international tests and numeracy and literacy, improving the achievement gap between indigenous and non-indigenous students. The first objective cannot serve as a purpose of school education because numeracy and literacy are means, not ends of education. For instance, what it means to be sufficiently numerate to study mathematics or the natural sciences is quite distinct from what it means to be sufficiently numerate to do one's taxes. Taking the government's current mission of school education as an example, what numeracy and literacy means as educational objective needs to be defined by their role in helping students to become lifelong learners and prepare them prepared for living in and contributing to a democratic, socially just and sustainable society. Literacy and numeracy defined this way might be quite different from how numeracy and literacy is defined in the national and international tests. Focusing on improving scores on national and international tests and numeracy and literacy without understanding the relevance of what is tested in light of a clearly articulated purpose of school education is thus putting the cart before the horse. It is identifying specific measures of school system success without deriving, from, uh, deriving those from an explicitly articulated purpose of school education. The second objective, Closing the achievement gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students is aligned with what we find in the current mission and vision, namely that all students are successful. However, without being explicit about what the purpose of school education is, in this case for Indigenous students, closing an achievement gap like the gradu graduation, gap, uh, graduation rate gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students is not really justified. Some indigenous scholars even argue that such an approach is actually very problematic for indigenous students because it measures educational success for indigenous students by their success in an education system that is built on non-indigenous values, curricula and practices. The discussion in this second part of the presentation suggests the following. First, the proposed as any other K-12 education reform requires to be grounded in an answer to the purpose question. Second, the identified purpose needs to be used to define school success. It needs to be used to find, to find and justify measures against which the education system is held to account. It needs to be used to identify and justify how the limited educational resources are spent. It needs to be used to frame school curricula and it needs to be used to frame policies and practices in schools and classrooms. To conclude my presentation on the need for and the direct direction giving role of the purpose of public education, I want to give voice to those in whose name we say we are concerned for the K-12 education system, the students. Recently, colleagues and I did a study on high school uh, students' understanding of what it means to them to live a flourishing life as students and the role of school education to help them live a flourishing life as students and future adults. Here's what students from one Winnipeg high school said are the capabilities that schools should develop in students in order for them to be able to live a flourishing life as students as well as, as adults. To communicate well with others, to relate to engage well and work well with other people, to work intelligently with one's emotions, to be self-directed, to manage one's time, to self-improve. These are all capabilities that require learning and some of them quite intensive and extensive learning of some sort, and such learning would benefit greatly from highly educated professionals, teachers, who can help students with that learning. Thus, how can there be a more worthwhile purpose for public education and public schools than to help our children to develop capabilities needed to live a flourishing life? And the list of capabilities the study participants identified would serve as well as a starting point when defining what we mean by school success, 
when defining the measures against which we hold the school system to account, when deciding how we should distribute educational resources, when developing or revising school curricula, and when developing policies for and engaging in educational practices in schools and classrooms. Thank you. I'll join all those in the chat who are thanking our speakers this evening for just an exceptional round of analyses um, of some of the issues that, um, that you've been picking up on, exploring, um, and helping us to think about, uh, in particular related to school structures and governance, uh, to leadership uh, and our rural contexts, especially, as well as the purpose of education. Thank you. Uh, to our speakers this evening. Uh, we do have a few minutes. Uh, the questions have been coming in. Uh, I doubt that we will be able to get to all of them. Uh, however, I'm, I am going to say that we're going to record these questions because as we're planning our webinars uh, in the future, um, we'd like to come back to some of these questions. And I think they may help us also to think about possible topics and speakers uh, that we can dig into uh, in future webinars. So thank you so much to those of you who have posed questions in the question and answer. Um, and if you still have questions and would like to pose them, uh, again, I, I don't think we'll have time to answer them all, but we certainly will um, read them and, and give that some thought in terms of suggestions uh, for, for future events. So thank you for that and for your participation in the chat and the questions uh, throughout uh, the, the presentations this evening. Um, I'm going to begin with one question that came in very early on uh, from Christine. She's saying, I'm having a hard time getting my head around the parent engagement officer. I hope that someone can help me understand how this position is supposed to work. I'm hoping someone will talk about how they think that parent engagement officer uh, role will function. I'm wondering if any of our panelists would like to speak to that question. I think it's a very good question. Uh, but I don't have a very good answer because I don't think any of the documents that I've read are at all clear. And, and it needs to be clear, you know. This is apparently a reform that's going to save $40 million. And we're going to have this new office. So it seems to me it's not going to be in, you know, someone in the news got to be hired. It's going to be an additional assignments for somebody. And... Uh, it's not clear at all to me about how that's been thought through. Um, so I can't really help, sorry, but it's a great question. I, I just can confirm what John is saying. The documents that the minister has put out so far are not very explicit on, on that and on many other aspects as well. Thanks. Um, we'll move to a question from Constantine. Uh, in reference to your second slide, and I believe Dr. Young, this was when, uh, was during your presentation. The PACs are planned to be eliminated from the new process, unless I'm misinterpreting it, Constantine writes. How will parents' input about their children's education be reflected in the new policy? Can you please elaborate about parental involvement in our children's education going forward? Uh, the intent is, I think, that there will be school community councils, um, all parents with students in the school will have, in a sense, membership in that council. And if I understand correctly, we'll elect a board or, or members to, to serve on a board. Um, and so to an extent, there's some similarity there with um, existing parent, parent advisory councils or advisory councils on school leadership. Um, the, the mandate of those 
school community councils is more elaborate uh, than was laid out previously. Um, and clearly that's one vehicle for parental involvement. Um, and then I think it's important to recognize that there are already lots of other vehicles for parents and teachers to communicate and be involved together, uh, looking after the well-being of their children. And those are maybe as important, more important than oversight on the, the governance of the school itself. I had a similar question in the chat. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is that because the school community councils, um, because the government has indicated that they will be funded, I think that will give them a different um, type of authority, a different type of influence um, within the community. And like Dr. Young said, um, I think that it's an expanded uh, sort of portfolio of things that they're being asked to do um, that sort of comes into things that uh, I think previously have been handled by in-school staff. Thanks. The next question uh, for the panel uh, from Dr. Marlene Atlio. She writes, 64 quashes the development of participatory democratic engagement with the educative process in the province. The public needs more, not less, understanding of how the cycle of policy operates, especially where policy originates so that they can evaluate the nature of the system's potential effects on the lives of their children and communities. There's a question mark, there's a statement, and I'm wondering how you might wish to respond. I can go, I think it's... <laughs> Go, Jackie. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, John. I'll follow you. Well, I think it's clear that this limits um, voices from diverse communities. I don't think that uh, I don't think there's any way that I can look at it that I don't see that limitation. Uh, I think that's clearly one of the things that I think moving forward we're going to have to resolve that. Can I come in? I mean, thank you, Marlene, for that long question comment. Um, one, one thing that does strike me, I mean, the minister was quoted in the paper a few days ago about saying this is a vocal minority that is opposing this proposal. I mean, I have to take exception to that, you know, because I drive around Winnipeg and I see signs and they are NDP signs for sure. And they are liberal signs for sure. And they are NTS signs, but they're on individuals lawns and there are a hell of a lot of them. So that's one thing. And I think that's encouraging, you know, that the public is interested in this and the public is concerned about this. And that's hugely encouraging, I think, for whatever happens, that to have that awareness. The other thing, and it relates to one of the questions that was uh, that I was reading on the on the chat uh, or in the Q and A. Um, it there's also a considerable amount of concern raised in favor of trustees. And that's to me quite refreshing because it's more often than not historically, the pe people would be ambivalent about trustees. You know, like, well, I don't need them today. I don't, you know, I don't like this one, whatever. But there's this considerable support, I think, for the value of trustees 
being made evident now in this, in this public debate. And I would urge anyone who, who's asked questions about acclamation of trustees or those kind of questions about the quality of trustees to look at the Manitoba School Boards Association's submission to the Education Commission. It's an, it's an incredibly impressive document. And it, there's a section in there that does a survey of trustees in Manitoba. And I think there's also a pan-Canadian document as well. The documents that talks about acclamation and how acclamation does not necessarily mean disinterest and talks about um, voter turnout and how voter turnout in itself is not a, a very effective indicator. And, and there's a very compelling argument, I think, made in that document about trustees doing their job. It documents how the trustees identify themselves in terms of their career, uh, et cetera, who they are, are they, you know, what are they? And that's another way that suggests these are not people without skills, without knowledge, you know. Um, so, so we need more public discussions for sure. It's always critical. And what's going on now is, is encouraging to me, I think. Maybe I can add to one aspect of Marlene's question, which is the question of, well, what are the consequences? How do we need to understand more of those? And I think that is uh, one of the motivating factors for this webinar series, uh, because we have the, the responsibility, I, I think, uh, also the, the paid luxury, uh, if I can say this with caution, uh, as academics to actually engage with, the, uh, with ideas and the implications of ideas and thoughts. Uh, and so uh, I, I appreciate the, the contribution that the three of us have made in an, analyzing the documents that are currently uh, very thin at the moment um, and, and, and uh, uh, talking about possible implications that we foresee uh, that we need to speak about and be, that need to be complementing the documents and, and, and that, the pub, that the government publishes. Because we need to know, we need to help the public to also understand uh, what are the complicated uh, the implications? Because once such a big change is made, right, uh, then it's too late uh, if people then realize, oh, if we had just known, this would these are the consequences. So for the good or the worse, um, uh, it, it requires a deeper understanding of uh, potential consequences, and I think that's what we've contributed uh, to to what tonight and will be next week as well. Thank you. And on that note, I would uh, highlight and emphasize the back-to-back -back, uh, comments, questions in the Q&A, uh, asking, has everyone signed up to speak out about Bill 64 at the legislature? Um, I, I know there are many more and more questions, and um, we look forward to coming back together again next week, uh, Thursday evening, June 17 at 7 o'clock p.m. And we will have part two of this webinar series, uh, which will focus on policy, inclusion, and Indigenous achievement. And there were many questions uh, around those uh, ideas in the Q&A tonight. So I invite you back next week and we'll delve into those issues uh, and, um, and, and pieces and topics a little bit more. Our speakers next week will be Dr. Jeannie Kerr, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Education, and Dr. Leslie Ebley Trudell, Associate Dean and Assistant Professor of Education, both from the University of Winnipeg, and Dr. Frank Deere, Canada Research Chair and Associate Professor of Education from the University of Manitoba. I do want to thank again our speakers this evening for the preparation of, uh, of your presentations and for um, helping us really think uh, meaningfully about uh, what does this mean and why does it matter in relationship to school systems and their structures, in relationship to leadership, and in relationship to the purpose of education.
And I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy evenings, busy lives uh, to come and um, to think with us and to probe deeper. Again, this is the beginning of a series and we hope you will join us again uh, for our next part next week and over the weeks and months to come. Thank you all and good evening.